Welcome to Sick Flicks, where we take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to examine some of the goriest and most disturbing movies ever made. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling Adam Green's cult classic slasher film, Hatchet. Released in 2006, Hatchet is a throwback to the 1980s, a time when slasher movies ruled the box office and video stores, and monsters like Freddy, Jason, and Michael Myers were household names. Green's film looks to introduce audiences to a new slasher cinema icon in the form of Victor Crowley, a deformed mutant killer haunting the Louisiana bayous with an axe to grind against anyone who crosses his path. This polished, modestly budgeted production benefits from a fun script, tons of horror icon cameos, and some fantastic practical effects work from the late John Carl Beekler. But how many barf bags will it earn on the gore card? We'll find out later, but for now, let's break down the plot. The film opens with these two yokels out in the swamp on a boat. Tucker and Dale? Is that you? Turns out that's actually Robert England. Pop your no-dos, kids, because Freddy Krueger's out in the bayou. England and his son Ainsley are out here hunting gators. But if this point of view shot is any indication, something is hunting them too. Since there's no bathroom on this boat, Ainsley's gonna help refill the swamp. What an environmentalist. Too bad he pisses right into a jump scare. Yeah, maybe taking a whiz on land is the way to go here. After he finishes draining the little alligator, he heads back to the boat, only to find that dear old dad has been gutted. I'm no Steve Irwin, but that doesn't look like the work of a gator. And it's not, as Ainsley discovers. His unseen assailant first disarms him, literally, and then rips him in two. You know, if the killer throws him back in the swamp, they could just change his name to Bob. And really, that's probably preferable to Ainsley. After that, we're treated to this handy title card. And it seems like a good time to point out that while the movie is called Hatchet, there's actually an axe on the poster and cover art. Man, I'm having witchboard flashbacks. From here, we wind up at Mardi Gras, which can mean only one thing, gratuitous boob shots. I'm too lazy to edit those out though, so you're just gonna have to take my word for it. After our parade through the credits, this group breaks off on their own. That's director Adam Green there in the hat. They stop to ogle some more boobs when budget Tom Green here asks this question. Haven't you seen enough boobs? You know this is a movie because no heterosexual man has ever uttered these words in real life. Debbie Downer here is going through a breakup and he's killing the party vibe. Trust me when I tell you that's hardly the only thing getting killed in this movie. Budget Tom Green, whose character name is Ben, has had enough of your typical Mardi Gras activities, e.g. ogling boobs, binge drinking, and projectile vomiting in the gutter, so he heads off to check out a haunted swamp tour he heard about. DeWitt and Robinson told me about this haunted swamp tour thing that they did last year. They said it was amazing. His friend Marcus isn't a total asshole, though. He tags along with Ben here. What a pal. You're gonna be so psyched you did this. I think I'd rather skin my own dick. They wind up at the local voodoo shop, which is closed. But luckily, knocking on the door five times summons Tony Todd. That's right, it's Candyman, and he looks like he's cosplaying a Final Fantasy villain. Todd tells the fellas he's not allowed to do haunted swamp tours at night anymore because of insurance reasons. If you thought this was because he took a group out there and got someone killed, you're wrong. He got sued for a slip and fall. And sued me for negligence! Tony Todd sends him to Marie Laveau's, and it's always a good sign when someone is out front puking all over the sidewalk. Inside, some dude is shooting his own version of Girls Gone Wild, imaginatively retitled as Bayou Beavers. And these two ladies clearly have feelings for each other. You're syphilis, Miss Big Words. Okay, that doesn't even make sense. I mean, hatred is a feeling, right? You're smitten. Um, he said act like you're smitten, not act like you're a kitten. The shop proprietor tells them he's running a swamp tour, and for $40 they can explore the haunted bayou. Forty bones each. $40 for a swamp tour? I bet you can find some toothless redneck named Cletus to take you out on his airboat for a banjo and half a smoked Marlboro. Ben and Marcus pay up and then board the bus with the rest of our potential victims, including Office Space's William Riley. Ben gets to sit next to Mary Beth, who looks both delighted to be here and thrilled with the seating arrangement. Mary Beth, that's a great name. Because it's actually two names. Dude, no wonder you got dumped. And with that, they're off. Christ, this bus ride is probably longer than the swamp tour. They finally arrive at the bayou and move over to the boat. While Sean here is trying to start the boat, some crazy Ralph type character is screaming at them that the swamp is haunted. Don't mind him, he's just a crazy dude who drinks his own urine. Sick. 
See, I wasn't making that up. Fun fact, that's special effects legend John Carl Beekler, who sadly passed away earlier this year. Anyway, they ignore him and Bayou Titanic sets sail. Marcus isn't having a good time. Come on, man, give it a break. This is fun. Not as fun as a bag of dicks. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna agree with that. After that, we boat through some exposition. Here we learn about Victor Crowley. Legend is, is that uh, he was a deformed man whose own father went nuts and whacked him in the face with a hatchet one night. Mary Beth calls bullshit on this story. It's not even the house. Sean's really giving it his all on this ghost tour, but no one's buying his spiel that these swamp gases are actually the spirits of the dead. Nah, bruh. Those are marsh vapors. I've seen this on TV. Hell, man, why'd you not come then? They might not be buying the ghost stories, but everyone jumps when he turns the lights back on. Something's out there in the dark, and it's definitely not swamp gas. Back on the boat, Ben pulls the classic dumped guy move and overshares. I'm gonna be honest with you right now. I uh, just got dumped by my girlfriend of eight years. Dude, no one wants to hear this. They sail on, and then the boat runs aground on a rock. Then it starts to rain. But hey, at least they're not sinking. Oh, my bad. Jim decides they should cross the down tree to reach land, and he stumbles right into a jump scare. That alligator is hungry. Mary Beth does her best Ms. 45 impression and saves the day. She's got the gun, so she's barking out order. Get into the shore! With his blood in the water, this whole place is gonna be a feature frenzy! Um, that's not how it works. That's what happens with sharks, not alligators. Safely on shore, they regroup, and it's time for some exposition. Turns out Mary Beth here is packing because she's out here looking for her father and brother. You know, Robert England and Ainsley. He's bleeding pretty badly. We can't carry him all the way home. If we don't get out of these woods right now, we're all gonna die. Well, that escalated quickly. Then it's time for a flashback. Kane Hodder's out here chopping wood and caring for his mutant kid who looks like his parents were Rawhead Rex and the Elephant Man. Then, like all good slasher films, we get to the sin of the story. Some mean kids inadvertently light the Crowley shack on fire. Victor's dad tries to save him, but accidentally smashes him in the face with an axe, not a hatchet, while trying to bust down the door. Yeah, that's gonna leave a mark, but let's be honest, will anyone really even notice? Anyway, Victor dies, but his ghost still haunts the woods according to legend. He wanders the swamp at night that hatchet slash across his face. So as bad as all that is, things are about to get worse, because they've come ashore right next to the Crowley house. Man, someone should get Chip and Joanna Gaines in here. This place is an episode of Fixer Upper waiting to happen. And of course, the road out of here leads right through Victor Crowley's estate. I'm guessing Victor doesn't care for visitors, let alone trespassers. Jim and Shannon decide to take point on the approach to Cassidy Crowley. I've got a bad feeling about this. <laughs> Yeah, told you. Victor comes rushing out to ask Jim a few questions. He clearly doesn't like the answers. Then, in what is Hatchet's most infamous scene, Victor grabs Shannon and rips her head in half. She's gonna have a splitting headache after that. Ms. 45 pops off a few rounds at our mutant murderer, putting one center mass. But will this be enough to stop Victor? What do you think? Dude looks like he's been mainlining trend while swimming in toxic waste. He's the buffest mutant this side of the Toxic Avenger. Also, kudos to this film for not killing the Asian guy or the black guy first. That's a nice change of pace. While the survivors have regrouped and are trying to figure out their next move, Shapiro, the Bayou Beavers dude, is making a break for it. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that's probably not gonna end well. He dashes out of cover and runs right into Victor, who concludes his head is a twist to open top. Damn childproof caps. It's a shame old Shapiro here wasn't more headstrong. With the gore out of the way, we take a detour through Exposition Bayou. This ends with Sean and Marcus duking it out like this is a Rush Hour sequel. Yeah, that's a dated reference. Don't mind me, I just watched Rush Hour on my Zoom. Also turns out Shapiro wasn't really who he said he was. Shocker. I don't know, this seems like an awfully elaborate scheme to get some free porn. Maybe just try the internet or head down to the strip club next time. They resume their trek, and man, you really gotta watch where you step in the swamp. You just never know when you might trip over a corpse. And to make sure you don't wander around in a giant circle. Ben and Mary Beth head off to the barn in search of weapons, and mostly just find Victor's secret food stash. Hey, a man's gotta eat. Oh, and she finds her brother and father. 
I'm guessing they'll be having a closed casket service for those two. While the rest of the gang is distracted by a raccoon in the bushes, Victor surprises everyone with a jump scare. Wait a minute, this movie is called Hatchet, not Louisiana Belt Sander Massacre. Of course, he hasn't actually killed anyone with a hatchet in this movie so far. So why start now? Victor gives Jenna a little facial work. After some serious exfoliating, she's ready for her close-up. Before he can finish her off, Mary Beth beats him with a shovel. Man, this movie's tool prop budget must have really been something. Axes, shovels, belt sanders. Maybe they blew their wad before they actually got around to buying a hatchet. Sean rushes in to grab the shovel, but Victor beats him to it. Rearmed, Victor gets a leg up on the competition. Sean won't be on Dancing with the Stars next season, that's for sure. The good news is his peg leg pirate costume is gonna kill next Halloween. Victor's about to finish Sean off, but Mary Beth starts firing. Too bad she's come down with a case of the stormtroopers and misses him completely. Free to get back to work, Victor digs in with the shovel. This seems like a good time to point out that heads will roll in this movie. Victor's not done though. Jenna's not dead yet. He grabs her, then impales her on the handle of the shovel like she's a bug on a pin. You want to make sure she's good and secure on there. Our dwindling number of survivors dashes through the swamp, then stops for more talking because, yeah, that seems like a great idea. After that, they decide to head off in the direction of the nearest jump scare. Hey, thanks for slowing down the talk so I could catch back up, guys. You're really making growing my kill count a whole lot easier. Somehow, Victor misses everyone, and Ben manages to stab him with a pitchfork, and then it's off to the races again. Yeah, maybe less stop in the chat next time, morons. Or not. They stop yet again, this time so Ben can make a case for standing their ground and trying to kill Victor once and for all. I'm saying we fight back. Hmm, maybe not the best idea. With their plan to light Crowley on fire set, they head back to the shed to find the gas. Naturally, this involves splitting up. This plan just keeps getting better. Of course, it's a better plan than calling the guy out as a form of half-assed distraction, so there's that. Hey asshole, come out, we're right here! In the shed, Ben's striking out with the gas. Victor gives him a heads up just to let him know he's thinking of him. What a guy. And a torso too, because why not? No point in letting all these body parts go to waste. Victor charges Ben, but Mary Beth plants a garden trowel in the back of his skull. Ben then douses him with gas before lighting him on fire. That's some really impressive Fantastic Four Human Torch cosplay. He goes up like Cropsy in the burning, and if you haven't watched my video on that slasher classic, check it out after this one. And I think we can change the killer's name from Victor Crowley to Victim Crowley now. But not so fast. This is a slasher movie. You know he's not really dead yet, right? Victor gets a little divine intervention in the form of rain. Dude really looked like he was on fire, but then he flamed out. Happens to the best of us. Mary Beth, Ben, and Marcus take this opportunity to flee and wind up in a cemetery. That's convenient. This way, when Victor kills them, no one will have to transport their bodies. They run through the graveyard and right into another jump scare. What's that? Victor finally has a hatchet? All right. Then he proceeds to toss it away and kills no one with it. Fleeing, they hit a locked gate, and it looks like it's game over for our heroes. Victor hops on Ben and is all like, hey, wanna swap spit? While Mary Beth kicks the monster in the face. They try to escape, but first Victor wants to play around a tug of Marcus. Who will win? Place your wagers now. Please bet responsibly. Mary Beth cheats, kicking Victor a few more times until he finally throws in the towel. Not so fast though. Victor's an affectionate dude and he's going to give Marcus a bear hug even if it kills him. And it probably will. Then Victor demonstrates all the stuff he learned at chiropractor college. You may hear some cracking noises and your arms might come out of their sockets, but you're going to feel great after this adjustment. Then he finishes him off with a neck realignment. That'll fix those vertebrae. Ben actually stops to puke after seeing that, and fun fact, that's real puke. Or at least the first take was. The second required a mixture of orange juice and cold clam chowder. Yummy. Mary Beth and Ben take off for the river, and Victor is all like, hey, don't go yet, you should stick around for a while, as he javelins a gate pole right into Ben's foot. Should've bought some steel-toed shoes, Ben. With his foot still impaled, Ben and Mary Beth bend the pole toward the charging Crowley, who runs right into it and impales himself and dies. Or does he? Yeah, one last death rattle for good measure. With Victor stopped, Mary Beth and Ben do the slasher film survivor walk through the woods, eventually finding her dead father's boat. They row on out of there and it looks like a happy ending. I mean, unless you've seen the original Friday the 13th. 
After some chatting about how they made it, which is the worst thing you can do, have these characters never seen a slasher movie before? Victor pops up and grabs Mary Beth, just like Jason. She's on her way to the bottom of Camp Crystal Lake, I mean the bayou, but manages to grab Ben's hand. Too bad it's no longer attached to Ben. Victor's all like, here, let me lend you a hand. Ben here doesn't need it anymore. And with Ben dying in the boat and Mary Beth caught in Victor's grasp, the movie fades to black. Cue credits. And that, my fellow gorehounds, is Hatchet. If you're feeling a bit confounded by that ending, don't worry. There are currently three sequels to Hatchet, and part two picks up right where the first film ends. Sure, that ending was a bit of a downer back during the film's original release, but these days you can just binge the entire series. One thing to note is that Mary Beth, who's played by Tamara Feldman in this film, is replaced by Scream Queen Danielle Harris in the sequels. While Hatchet may not break new narrative ground compared to its golden era slasher film inspirations, there's no denying that this film offers up plenty of splatter for the discerning gore geek. How many barf bags did Victor Crowley fill during this film? Let's score it on the gore card and find out. In terms of gross anatomy, Hatchet offers up plenty of splatter. We've got an axe murder, belt sander facials, limb removals, multiple decapitations, and that absolutely fantastic head ripping gag. John Carl Beekler was a special effects legend, and his work here shines as some of the best in his storied career. Victor may not kill anyone with an actual hatchet, but he certainly delivers death with a wide variety of other implements. And because of that, Hatchet earns four barf bags out of five. This is some sensational splatter, a real homage to the good old days when slasher movies were filled with over-the-top kills and practical effects work. Have you seen Hatchet? If so, let me know what you thought of it in the comment section below. And while you're down there, why not like this video and subscribe to the channel? I just started a new business giving haunted swamp tours across the street from Casa de Bracken and I need some captains and crew members to work the boat. You wouldn't want to miss out on that, would you? Of course you wouldn't. Oh, and while you're here, check out some of my other videos. You'll find links to more sick flicks here on the screen. Come on, you know you want to watch another? I'll see you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.